Great. A warm welcome to all of you to this Takshashila conversation. The Takshashila Institution is a network think tank and a school of public policy. Physically, we are located in Bangalore, but operating around the world since 2010 over the internet. As an independent, nonpartisan policy research think tank, we're engaged with India's relationship with the world, transforming how India is governed, and exploring the intersection of technology, Great. A warm economics, to all of you and this politics. Is Takshashila conversation. The Takshashila Institution is a network think tank and a school of public policy. Physically, we are located in Bangalore, but operating around the world since 2010 over the internet. As an independent, nonpartisan policy research think tank, we're engaged with India's relationship with the world, transforming how India is governed, and exploring the intersection of technology and economics to all of you. And Please take a look at our public policy education programs that are tailored specially for people like you. They're all online and you can take them from anywhere. We have both short one semester certificate programs as well as year long graduate programs in public policy, defense and foreign affairs, technology and biotech policy as well. To connect with us, please subscribe to our newsletter and podcast. Depending on your interest, we deliver sharp and timely analysis that allow you to reduce the information overload and get to the heart of the matter. Now we begin today's conversation with Nitin setting the context. Thank you, Soumya. Clearly, uh, the, there's been something about information overload here because we've heard you like three times saying the same thing. So uh, it's either a Chinese conspiracy to sort of uh, sabotage this conversation or uh, something to do with information overload, which we will have to uh, find out as time goes along. At least I hope that I'm not being heard more than once because that would be a crime on humanity. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm, I'm glad uh, all of you are joining us for this wonderful conversation with, uh, with Prabal uh, and the two Adityas. Uh, you know, let me just start this to give you some context. I was talking to a foreign reporter uh, earlier this week, and this person asked me uh, whether, uh, you know, 1962 has any bearing on uh, what's happening on the borders today. And I said, uh, 1962, hmm, probably yes. And what about 1967? And the guy says, 1967, what 1967, right? And then uh, of course I referred him to Prabal's book, but I think a, a lot of us uh, talking about India and China, especially in the military space, remember 1962 as a sort of a watershed event, uh, which it was no doubt, but what happened in 1967 has a very, very important bearing on India's military approach to the border. And very few of us know it. Uh, it's not talked about as much as 1962 is. Uh, we have very little in terms of uh, popular conversation. You do have some of the forgies who, you know, who talk about 1967, but the wider discourse sort of, there's an empty hole, uh, big empty hole as far as uh, 1962 is concerned, 1967 is concerned. And, uh, uh, and I'm so glad that Prabal has a book, uh, which, which can be, you know, which is a mass market book, which people can read and educate themselves on what happened uh, in 1967. Uh, I won't, I won't get into the, you know, you know, giving the spoilers now, but I just want to thank Ajitya Sondi, uh, himself a scholar, uh, not just a legal scholar, but also a military historian, uh, a school historian, a person who's intimately uh, interested in uh, defense and foreign affairs and, uh, you know, uh, represents Karnataka, fights for Karnataka in the courts uh, and fights for the good fight in many other situations. I'm, I'm very gra uh, grateful that uh, uh, Aditya introduced Prabal and uh, to this conversation. And when, when, that con when, when that introduction happened, little did we know that we'll be, you know, scheduling it on a day when, we, you know, things are hot. I mean, this has become suddenly not something of an academic uh, interest or of a you know interest to military historians alone, but has great current affairs significance. So uh, I would just hand over to Aditya Ramanathan, our uh, multi-talented host who runs our podcasts, who does research in uh, defense and foreign affairs, works on nuclear issues and so many other secret things. Uh, before I hand it over to him, I just want to leave the panelists with a with a request that uh, if you could bring the, some of these conversations to what does it mean for the con, you know what does it mean for policy today 
what are the learnings which the armed forces leaderships need to take away what are the learnings which the media and the political types need to take away from this i think we'll we'll achieve a lot more so on this note i'll just uh, hand it over to aditya ramanathan and uh, go into the quiet mode uh thanks so much nathan uh like you pointed out uh, this is quite unexpectedly uh, a timely and a sort of grim moment for us in india with the death of our soldiers uh i will just point out uh, you know going referring to probal's book 1967 was wasn't exactly a peaceful time either you know you had america's war in vietnam was going into full sw- full swing and in june of that year you had the six day war between the arab states and the israelis uh, this was just 3 months before the events uh, that probal uh, recounts in his book and it was also a violent time for india that's really uh, smack in the middle of this whole decade of wars from the liberation of goa in 61 Uh, right up to liberation of bangladesh in uh, 71 and in between you have this uh, loss to china you have kind of draw with pakistan and uh, you also have this uh, rather extraordinary and completely forgotten victory uh, uh, with china in 1967 uh, i you know i i really enjoyed reading probol's book i'll tell you that uh, military history is su- a subject i'm also quite passionate about and uh, it's a criminally un- underserved uh, market in india uh it's it's this best sort of military history because somehow in just in less than 300 pages probol manages to combine diplomatic strategic uh operational tactical details all of it and 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 yet make it accessible to uh general readers uh so i would also definitely uh recommend that book the book for everyone over here to read uh uh, uh dr sondi uh, i'll i'll call you dr sondi because the two of us adityas over here uh would you like to share your thoughts on the book uh sure uh, thank you aditya thank you nitin for putting this together and we are indeed having this conversation today at a difficult time i think we should dedicate our our session today to the memory of those officers and jawans who have uh, succumbed in the line of duty in galwan may they rest in peace um probal's book uh, has appealed to me at many levels i think first and foremost i want to say that it represents an important dimension of retired officers coming forward to partake in military scholarship as you know probal is uh, been a gorkha officer he is a second generation forgi but he along with a few others i've noticed are coming forward to contribute to objective military history which i think is an important aspect for us to take note of the book itself is light and readable i say light in a complimentary sense because it as you said aditya it uh, you know very seamlessly transcends operational geopolitical strategic even espionage issues uh, over 200 odd pages with not very heavy referencing with you know sort of references pushed to end notes all of which makes it uh, a very palatable read it's an important piece of writing also because i think probal brings the backdrop to 1967 into the conversation um lesser known parts about the role that china and mao played um in the 65 war post 65 when it came to their meddling in internal affairs in sort of meso and naga um aspects later sikkim even the naxalbari movement being sort of hijacked by china make for an interesting backdrop i had read in mao's uh, biography where hung jang mentions that china had prepared itself to precipitate matters to a nuclear uh, level if required during the 1965 war which we were fighting with pakistan it so happened that the cease fire took place in that uh, luckily that nuclear trigger need not have been uh, uh, reverted to but these are the sort of back stories about china the inscrutable uh, strategies and tactics that they deploy i think that we need to bring into the frame and probal does that in his book his books uh, also important uh, because it fills this void that nitin mentioned that 67 is never spoken about and as as his book says um, you'll also see it behind uh, probal tucked away on his library india's forgotten war over china and it makes you wonder why it's forgotten i'm going to be asking uh, probal that because what do you normally you tend to forget or or whitewash your defeats but here was a victory where in a ratio of about 
one is to four we prevailed we took out about 400 chinese uh, soldiers there was exemplary courage there was strong leadership at the top and yet this operation for some reason has been expunged from our military history and therefore again this book i think fills in an important void it's got interesting trivia for me for example the bit about uh, colonel raza winning a nishane haider based on a recommendation of an indian officer colonel aire which was fascinating i wasn't aware of it um, trivia about uh, baba harbhajan's shrine about lance naik somnath who's not an officer but is in fact a calf in the army who looks out for minefields and so on but i think of all of this the most important aspect of uh, probal's book is the timing and 53 years later after having held a peace a sort of a, a status quo with china we are today discussing galwan and therefore i want to with your permission begin by asking probal two questions not just about his book but also the interface with what we are on today which is probal why is 67 a forgotten operation and is it is it a is it a cultural lag do we not document military history well enough and correspondingly what are the lessons we can learn to make sure that 2020 galwan is not forgotten as well as we speak there has been a uh, sort of unprecedented uh, combat fist to fist fighting we've lost boys in the process we've taken out uh, chinese boys none of us really know the the inside details and therefore my related question perhaps if you could take both is why is 67 forgotten and how can we ensure that that does not happen with 2020 sorry probably you're on mute yeah yes thank you aditya um, so the i think you can hear me now yeah. Uh, thank you, Aditya Ramanathan and Nitin for, uh, you know, hosting this uh, session today. And uh, and thank you, Takshashila, for, for having me uh, on the session. I think, um, thank you for the, the, the introduction and the kind words about the book. Nitin, um, so, uh, and, and uh, Aditya, and uh, one of the things, Aditya, you, so you, to your question, straight away jumping to your question about how uh, this book, uh, was uh, and why this book was forgotten uh, why uh, today how today we need we need to make sure that galwan isn't forgotten similarly so let me come to the first part of your question about uh, the book and you you've you've spoken about certain aspects of the book uh, well uh, you know when i was writing the book interestingly and let me take a step back in terms of uh, how it formed. So when I was writing the book, it was during the Doklam crisis in 2017. Uh, it so happened that uh, I was talking about the, 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 the 1967 victory to somebody over lunch. And I happened to mention that, look, we must uh, go back to reference 1960. We must remember 1967 as the last time that, we, uh, that India and China faced off militarily and India prevailed over China. I saw a look of complete, uh, you know, disbelief. And uh, thereafter, I, I, I figured, and you know, I knew before that as well that you know, not much is known about uh, 1967. And I also remember watching uh, TV channels and uh, looking at uh, the information and the writings that were coming out. It was all about uh, the reference to 1962. Uh, that's when I thought that you know, there, there was there was something in between that had been forgotten. Now, to, to your point about your question about why we've forgotten 1967, I primarily, I and mean, that's a question I set out uh, with when I was researching the book. Uh, to me, three, three important reasons jump out. One is that if we look at 1967, it was, uh, it was five years after 1962. And the psychological pressure and, and, and the whole, uh, it, Used to call it the 10, 10 foot tall Chinese soldier. That that kind of image was was over us, was all over us because nineteen because of nineteen sixty two. So so there was a there was a kind of uh, lack of self belief. I would say whether it was the you know uh, 
the, the perceptions that we drew about the Chinese and about ourselves and about the capability that we, we would have had or our perceptions of our capability at that point of time. So that, that was one. So it was not, if you, uh, so I went through the media headlines of 1967 of October around that time. Uh, there, were, there were headlines about how, what had happened at Napula, what had happened at Chola, but they were relegated to certain points on the front page. And after that, there was not much of discussion around it because it was thought that it was perhaps a one-time, you know, skirmish that, that had taken place. And therefore, the, the two battles have been, you know, mentioned in our history as skirmishes, whereas a thousand casualties had happened on both sides. A lot of hundreds of people had got killed, hundreds of soldiers on the Indian side, uh, uh, Indian and Chinese side together, about 400 uh, plus on the Chinese side, and 88 on the Indian side. And yet we, and you, there was use of artillery, and yet we called it skirmishes. So that, that, that itself, you know, gives us an indication of how we thought of those battles. That was one. Secondly, our four years after 1967 came 1971, which was our grand victory. Uh, the greatest victory a nation had had uh, after the Second World War, where the, uh, the, 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 the defeated nation was made to sign a surrender document. Uh, so 1971 kind of whitewashed everything that came before it. That was one of the reasons, again, I thought that it was, it was forgotten. The third reason, which is something quite intriguing, is that, you know, if you look at wars and battles, they generally have an involvement of the political leadership at a, at a much greater level. 1967, though, had, had there, there were some issues that had happened before that, which involved uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi's pushing back the Chinese uh, in, in, a, in, in a tussle that involved diplom diplomats in Beijing and India. Uh, that was before 1967, but the battles of 1967 essentially involved the leadership on ground, the military leadership of General Sagat Singh. So, and I and I tried to understand how battles, wars over history have 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 had their space in in the in our history books, and I realized that wherever there is a political involvement, the retention of that of that battle or that war as a memory in our space of history is much more uh, than uh, if it involves the military leadership on ground because the narration, the, 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 narr the narrative is not taken forward as, uh, as, as, as strongly or as permanently as it would be if there was a political leadership uh, attached to it, which, could, which can then own the, the victory at that level. So I think that was the other thing that it was, it was a military victory. Uh, as not as not as much of a political victory as it was in 1971, uh, in which case there was a political decision, there was a military decision. Here, the military leadership took a decision and overturned uh, the the tide or you know, turned the tide against the Chinese and, and won those two battles. So these three reasons kind of combined to uh, sort of push that uh, those two battles uh, into a space uh, where we forgot about them. Uh, I will just. Uh... You know, connected to that, I want to ask you, uh, since these two battles have been completely forgotten or largely forgotten in this country, uh, you know, you don't have a lot written on this. Uh, and yet you have, uh, your book is, 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 is absolutely amazing to read. It's, it's so vivid. How did you piece this together? What were your sources? Yes, um, that's a very important, ex excellent question, um, Aditya. So, as we all know, Unlike the US, there is no 30 year rule for disclosing uh, facts of history. Uh, I must also mention that we don't have official histories for 1962 or 1971, which is, which is something that you know, connects to the earlier question of Aditya that you know, military history isn't as well remembered as it should be because it talks about our, you know, the, the past that shapes that shaped the, the years to follow. So when I started out, there was an issue of getting uh, inputs about what happened on ground. Uh, so, so when I started, I knew, I, I thought I knew a lot about what had happened, but I realized as it happens with most research that, you know, I had actually started with about 15 to 20% of what actually had transpired during that time. Uh, it was a combination of using inputs that were there in secondary form, whether they were short newspaper articles 
or works of uh, established scholars uh, of history, whether it was, uh, you know, Bertil Lindner or, you know, the many scholars who've written about India and China over the years, uh, using those little dots and connecting those dots as far as secondary uh, resources were concerned, talking to people on ground. And I, I think I was fortunate that, you know, people who have, this is, this is like we're talking about over, over half a century has passed since that since those battles are taking place so there were young men at that point of time who are now older much older in their 80s some some of them in their 90s uh, they uh, and they lived all over they they are now uh, you know living in their homes or places across india so i had to travel to those places meet with these people meet with first hand sources meet with people uh, in sikkim uh, you know i i spoke with uh, the soldiers who, who were part of these battles i spoke with uh, uh, officers and soldiers and some people who were, uh, you know, sort of, you know, who knew the characters well. I spoke with the aide, um, the ADC of General Sagat. I, I spoke with the family of General Sagat. I spoke with uh, uh, Colonel K.V. Joshi, who's 95 today and lives in Dehradun. Uh, but I must say that, you know, most of these sources, Injong Lama and Sikkim, I mean, he was one of the uh, main, uh, one of the important players of the, uh, the, the architect of the Chola battle. Uh, the memory of these people, this, uh, the, these first-hand sources, is very so very ro robust that they could recount uh, every uh, you know, minute of the battle and what led to it, what happened there, uh, which made it very intriguing. I also discovered along the way that there were other aspects uh, connected to Nathula and Chola in that period, which Aditya mentioned about the, the espionage incident, about... Uh, the, uh, the involvement of, uh, you know, Parvez Musharraf in 1965, the, the in India-Pakistan war, what happened uh, in uh, Nakshalbari, who were the two Indian uh, pilots who flew sorties uh, in, in Mizoram and bombed Aizol in, in the 1960s, who went on to become politicians. So there, there are these things that kept unraveling and kept me going. Uh, one of the things that I did was to join these dots. There was a narrative that was forming up uh, it was fascinating because it was a it was a combination of looking at limited resources available on sec from secondary sources, but a lot of uh, lot of uh, first hand information and other sets of information that could make sense that made sense to identify uh, the the events in history that were connected to the to the main narrative of uh, Chola and Nathula of nineteen sixty seven. So yes, it, it was it was it was tough, but it it made for a fascinating journey to pick up these various dots from uh, from from the past. Right. I mean, now that you've uh, told us how you connect with the dots, uh, just to get uh, everybody oriented, uh, can you tell us what exactly happened in 1967? What were these battles? How? What were their origins? What? How did they proceed? What? Are the, what was the outcome? Sure. So, how did they happen? What happened there, and what was the outcome? The book starts with 1965, uh, because as I said, you know, we we need to. Uh, the, if, if you look at uh, 1971 and 1962, 62 was a defeat against China, and 1971 was a grand victory against Pakistan. Uh, one, of, one of the things that I wanted to find out was what happened in between. How did we turn uh, a victor from, from, from a time in 1962 when we, were, uh, when we had suffered heavy losses and uh, reverses? So what happened that made us so strong, strong enough to to emerge victors in 1971. There were other tactical reasons that we can, we can assign to 1971, but what happened uh, in, in, the in the period that, that lay in between? So the book starts with 1965. The reason is that you know, there had been certain changes that had happened after the defeat of 1962. Uh, there were changes in the political and military leadership. We all know uh, that uh, there was not much of a, you know, uh, uh, the relationship wasn't, wasn't very effective in 1962 between the, the political leadership and the military leadership. They were not very much aware of the ground situation, which led to uh, reverses. This, the, you know, if you look at 1962, the soldier on the ground, the military forces on the ground, whether it was Rezangla or uh, various other places, they, they fought valiantly. They fought very well. So what was the, what was the, what was the weakness? And 1965 kind of enables us to understand what had changed and what had changed with the civil military relationship at that point of time. Uh, the defense minister, uh, Chaman and uh, you know, the, the, the 
the battle, the war commander of that time, General Harbaksh, uh, they uh, functioned very well. So did the, and along with the Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri, they together could create a, a th kind of thinking that was very much removed from what India had been in the past. They had, so that's where the story starts because this, it was the start of offensive thinking. It was the first time that uh, when, when uh, and the book starts with how uh, China and Pakistan got together to actually uh, stretch India on the Western and the Eastern border. And, and that's how, uh, you know, there were, there were certain plans that were going on and that's where the book starts. It, it talks about how China was trying to open up another front for Pakistan. It was trying to, that is the time it started to knock on the doors of Sikkim. So the idea, of 1965 war was not just to, you know, for, for, for Pakistan, not, not, for, not only for Pakistan to attack India, but also to annex uh, Kashmir and Sikkim on the other side. Remember, Sikkim was not a part of India. So 1965 started this phase. And that's why the story starts from 1965 about Sikkim, because that was the first time that China started to knock on the doors of Sikkim, having occupied Tibet before that. And, and when it started to do that in 1965, which is not known to, you know, which has not been, it's not been recounted as much in history, that we, we all talk about the Western Front, that yeah. India and Pakistan were, you know, were at war. But what happened on the Eastern Front was that China was knocking on the doors of Sikkim, trying to push India back. Uh, and, and as I said, you know, it was the first time that India had adopted an offensive posture, had, had, had defended against the initial Pakistani assault. And then had uh, you know swung uh, the the entire war uh, differently by by like mounting a counteroffensive against Pakistan, which changed the the complexion of the war, and the Chinese didn't move further uh, uh, in Sikkim. So that uh, set the tone of the in, of India-China relations, and that's that's pre-1967. Uh, let's also remember, and think uh, you did mention Nitin mentioned that. <laughs> the relations weren't hunky-dory at that time. And, and there was a lot of psychological pressure on India from China. One other thing the book mentions about, and this is why 65 is important, is that uh, during the course of the war, China had uh, pressured India to move back from the watershed ridge and from Nathula. And that's where the story of Nathula starts. And that's why the relevance of Nathula and, the, and, and a decision that was taken by General Sagat uh, a relatively underrated decision, but perhaps one of the most important decisions in history. He decided, despite the pressures of the Chinese, despite the, uh, I would say, non-cooperation of, you know, or, or, or he didn't get, did get the kind of backing that he would have, he would have needed from his superiors at that point of time. Uh, he didn't back up, though the Chinese wanted him to move back from Nathula, he did not. He stayed put, he decided to stay put at Nathula. Why is that important? Because uh, Nathula is on a watershed ridge. Now, if you look at uh, the map of India, there is, the, there is a narrow chicken's neck kind of, a, you know, sort of a feature that goes up from North Bengal. It's, it's like a squeezed paste from a toothpaste tube that sort of merges, if I may put it this way. And the, 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 uh, so, so the eastern part of India is connected to the rest of India through that little neck. And uh, if Nathula had been vacated as what the Chinese wish, wish was, which is what the Chinese, the Chinese wanted, then they would have, uh, then we would have, you know, retreated below. And that was the, that was a, it was a similar kind of a, a, a tactic that India had used in 1962, that, you know, withdraw from the front, hold your, uh, you know, defenses in depth and let the enemy come in and then we'll take, off, take them off. That would have been disastrous if we had repeated the decisions of 1962, which is what where it was going. It was General Sagat who changed the tide, who decided to stay put there against the wishes of uh, a lot of people and uh, much to the dismay of the Chinese. And, and that did not allow the Chinese to sit on the watershed ridge on Nathula. <laughs> As I was mentioning, you know, otherwise they would have rolled down to Sikkim and cut India off at the Siliguri. Uh, they, which is the chicken's neck, which is called the Siliguri Corridor, which, if I may put it, uh, is about 24 to 25 kilometers of uh, width at certain places. And please remember, uh, the Siliguri Corridor, on, on the eastern side of the Siliguri Corridor, lies the present uh, Bangladesh, which was then 
East Pakistan. So China needed just to, to cut India off by traveling 25 kilometers. And, uh, you know, they would have linked up with the East Pakistan troops and would have cut off the eastern part of India in the 1971 war. So the relevance of 1971 uh, lies somewhere in 1965 as well. And then we come to 1967. And, and, they, and, and because China was rebuffed in 1965, a lot of things that happened between 65 and 67 also kind of tell us where this relationship was going. Uh, China had te tested its... Uh, you know, nuclear capabilities in 1964, 1963, they had done two tests successively. Um, and uh, it, was, uh, it was wanting to establish itself in the region in the manner that it, it had done in 1962, which had supported Pakistan in 1965. So the intent was to be more aggressive and push India back. So the events that followed, and you mentioned about, uh, you know, the incidents in that period, which included the espionage, uh, which included the... Um, the diplomatic tussle between India and uh, and China. I'll leave it to the readers to read yeah. uh, what happened in that time, 66, 67. Uh, there was also I new here, Sorry. Um, you, yeah. you, if I may come in here, you've made a couple of uh, very important observations and I want to therefore uh, react sure. to a couple of them and just park them for you to respond in due course. Sure. Uh, you made an important point that... Um, Military history, in a sense, is dependent upon the political influence in that theater. And you yeah. also mentioned the singular role that General Sagat played. And he didn't necessarily get tied up in red tape. He didn't wait for formal instructions from New Delhi, which could have delayed matters to ridiculous lengths. He also paid the price for it. He went into oblivion for a while after 67, only to return then in 71 and again sort of play an important role. So my first sort of broad question to you is, this disconnect with not just uh, New Delhi and the political establishment, but also with the army headquarters in a sense is something we've seen later in, you know, in uh, IPKF uh, in Sri Lanka, we've seen it in Kargil 99 and so on. Where do civil military relations stand today, according to you? Are we still in that sort of gray area that we were in 67? Has the establishment of the post of the CDS, the Chief of Defense Staff, uh, taken things forward? Is that going to materially improve these sort of scenarios in the future? And my second set of questions, so I can also plant these for you to, to consider and respond, relates in a sense to what we're seeing today at the border. Um, what is it that has enabled us to maintain this broad peace for 53 years, right? Of course, there have been skirmishes and we've seen Doklam and so on. But there, there has to be a, a reason why that peace has been breached to the extent that it has in the recent days. Is this premeditated? Is it related in some way to our coming closer to the US? Is it Aksai chain? Is it uh, COVID? What, according to you, is the trigger? Because I've heard versions that this is, you know, um, an off-the-cuff ad hoc uh, encounter that has taken place. Fisty cuffs have taken place. It's not formal combat. But if you if you look at uh, the Chinese way of things, and uh, Shiv Kunal Varma says this in his book on 62, that the maximum brutality that we saw was after the ceasefire was announced. In the few days after the ceasefire, the commanders on the ground had issued clear instructions that take no prisoners of war, eliminate Indian soldiers as much as you can. And that's where the maximum sort of violence, if you will, took place, which was really not ethical by any standards of war. So I, I have find it a little difficult to believe that this is an, an, a sort of an accident that has taken place. There has to be some reason that's driving it. And what, according to you, that could that be, considering we've held a sort of a peace for, for over 50 years. Yeah. So I'll, I'll briefly address the previous, uh, the two questions, uh, Aditya, and I'll yeah. address the previous one uh, first, and then come to the more contemporary one. So the more we look at the present, the more we look at the past. The more we look at the present, the more we're reminded of the past. So that's, that's, that's the way I would like to start the response. Reason. Uh, if we look at 
the, the events that happened and there is 1967 before us, 1986 Sondarumchu and, I, and I've uh, written about how Sondarumchu transpired. Uh, I spoke with uh, General Varma, General Sharma, General B.N. Sharma was there um, and, and as to what happened because he was the Eastern Army commander at that point of time. Later on, he went on to become uh, the Indian Army chief. And uh, to your question, the, there, there, there was a severe disconnect between the army commanders thinking on ground and what the bureaucracy and the dip diplomats and the, and, the, and the establishment is thinking in Delhi. Uh, and that's why in 1986 in Somdurung when the Chinese had uh, come and sat on Indian soil, and this is the impact of 1967, that the template of 1967 was again picked up by General, General Sundarji and he, uh, put, uh, he took an entire brigade and heli lifted an entire brigade and uh, as part of uh, Operation Falcon and uh, put them in, in, uh, in the surrounding areas and started to dominate the Chinese. So, so what happened then was the speed and surprise, which, was, which were the key elements and very easy to always talk about them, but very difficult to implement, uh, which were actually implemented in 1967 by Sagar. Uh, and were, were, were again something that uh, were those two elements which was which were implemented by General Sundarji in 1986, which spotted the Chinese and pushed them two to three to four kilometers behind. But what I'm coming to is when the Chinese came and sat there, the instructions for General Sundarji and General Sharma were to move the troops back, uh, you know, pull them back. Now, General Sharma had uh, mentioned to General Sundarji at that point of time, since he knew the lay of the ground, he said, you know, we don't have infrastructure like the Chinese do. So if we were to pull back uh, and if something were to happen at the uh, line of actual control, they would take much lesser time to reach there vis-a-vis -vis us who would take a uh, few days. So he says, and therefore we shouldn't leave those places. Uh, it was not very well understood in Delhi. So somebody called up uh, when, when they were speaking with General Sundarji. Uh, and asked him to retreat. General Sundarji said uh, that no, we won't. And uh, somebody from Delhi, from the, uh, the defense ministry official, he said, he told the chief that, look, the prime minister isn't happy. So General Sundarji told him that, look, I think your prime minister is not getting the right advice. Uh, Rajiv Gandhi, then prime minister, flew to uh, the, the area sometime later. And he, he asked the troops, and this is the, this is the mindset that they have. So he asked the troops whether you want to be here or you want to retreat. He said, so, so that was the, that was the mindset. That's the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, the active, aggressive mentality that uh, troops would have, uh, not that they would uh, be immediately thrown into a war, but to, to defend your territory, you need a, a, an aggressive mindset. Now, Coming back to your civil military relations, uh, and, and this is something that has happened, uh, and it's also the personality that has mattered in 1971 when Prime Minister Indira Gandhi asked uh, General Sam Maniksha whether he would like to launch operations into Bangladesh. He said, you know, let the monsoons pass, and after that, we would go in, and the Prime Minister agreed to the General's advice. Uh, so, you know, it has also been personality driven. But the, in, the, the institutionalization of the, of the command structure in terms of how the army should operate has, has been, you know, uh, has been missing in a, in a way that, you know, it has, it has uh, therefore, the kind of uh, leadership that has prevailed on the actions on the, on the, you know, over the years in terms of where the army should go, how they should move has, has, been, has been dictated by a, a rather defensive mindset in Delhi, and that's kind of been evident in the way some of the decisions have taken place. If you, if you have left the decisions to the generals on the ground, or if you have understood the lay of the terrain, then, uh, you know, which was in 1967 or in 86 or in 1971, we've had better results. It is, it is only when it has not been understood by uh, the establishment in Delhi or the bureaucracy in Delhi uh, has has there been a gap between the military and the civil leadership? The institutionalization is also something that we are moving towards. Is the uh, the post of the CDS would is it's a, it's an early uh, it, the, these are early days and hopefully there are more powers and of implementation. We make a lot of uh, uh, 
uh, you know, announcements and policy announcements in India, which is which is good. But I think implementation is the key. It's a it's a good step to have the CDS, which was which has been long in the making, and you know, finally we have that. But how does the CDS office operate? How does what kind of powers does he have? What does he you know? All of these are important to see, and in in the times to come, it will. Uh, we, we will know better, but I think it's a good start to have the CDS uh, post there. Uh, your, your, I'm sorry, your, your, can, you, can you just give me your, I forgot the second question that you had. Yeah, Prabhupada, the question was with what's happening today and why, why yeah. do you think it's happening? What is the trigger? Why has a, a sort of a broad piece yeah. that you've held for 50 years suddenly succumbed? Is it, is it premeditated or do you see an, an ulterior motive or distraction even on the part of the Chinese establishment. Right, right. I think it's uh, uh, the first thing that I would want to uh, kind of strike off is that it's an instinctive reaction. I don't think there is any, there has been any instinctive, sudden, accidental Chinese uh, uh, action at any point of time in the past. Even 1967 was dictated by certain uh, plans that the Chinese had with respect to the watershed region, with respect to uh, the, the, the chicken's neck. Um, so every action is that happens on the ground, as far as China is concerned, is a function of the leadership decision, of a central leadership decision made at the highest levels of PLA and the CPC. So that's something that's very clear. Now, so having, you know, having you know, moved that possibility out of the, you know, range of options uh, the, the the few things that stand out therefore uh, you know if I were to put it internally and externally internally China has been facing certain issues and we, we are aware of of the pressure that that uh, the aspects of the global pressure of corona that has built up on China there's there's a lot of internal pressure that uh, that has been built up on Xi and his uh, government as well uh, let's remember there was a CPC session in some time back in uh, towards the end of May, and uh, that had kind of also uh, put a, letter, a lot of pressure on, on Xi and what he needs to do to reestablish or reassert China's place in the world. Uh, that was the internal, those were internal issues and the CPC session clearly identified that uh, China needed to be more assertive. That's something that came out of the CPC session that was held in Beijing uh, some, a few weeks ago. So, so there was the internal pressure that that was one part. Secondly, and and this is more more from a strategic uh, level, is that you know China doesn't want India to play a greater role in the uh, in the region in the wake of the Corona crisis because uh, it faces a lot of pressure internationally, and the closest, the biggest power in the region is India, and uh, India is going to be at, uh, you know India has a, has a see as a is now has now got a position in the WHO as well. Uh, India plays an important part in terms of uh, the Quad, in terms of D10, in terms of being part of the US allies. I think that that's something that plays at the heart of uh, some of the long-term uh, reasons that China would have in uh, opening up this dispute again. Uh, Thirdly, and this is, uh, I, would, I would say it's tactical, but at the same time, you know, it has a strategic connotation. Uh, India does. Uh, China doesn't want India to build the infrastructure along the LSE, and especially though. So you can say why? Uh, why Ladakh? Why not somewhere else? Now Ladakh, the the road that links up to Dolad Bay Goldi, uh, is is very close to Aksai Chin, and uh, and and there's a there's a there's a feeder road from these axes, which which is where the the the, the skirmish happened two days ago, which uh, which actually enables India to you know, be closer to Aksai Chin. And I think that's the, the, the fear of, of Chinese is that India would interfere with Aksai Chin and ultimately the CPC uh, line that goes to Pakistan at some point of time. That That is another uh, thought that is that has been doing the rounds because if you look at it, ever since the, you know, India abrogated the Article 370, uh, China has taken the Kashmir issue to UN uh, four times in the last six months. The last one was in January, February, when uh, there was a Corona crisis at home in China, they were uh, arguing about the Kashmir issue in the UN. I think at the back of their minds, that is something that also 
plays a part that look uh, rcpc corridor could sometime be interfered with the the other reason the fourth reason is that in uh, china wants to take expand this conflict into a more surrogate field and that's why you see nepal in lipu lake that is why you also you know see uh, the 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 pakistanis playing a role in future as well and, and they have been propped up over the years pakistani government etc so nepal is 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 a new addition and you will we had seen maldives earlier in different way maldives is also you know it is being propped up so wherever there are weaker political systems or authoritarian systems weaker states um, china has been pursuing its bri project in the neighborhood the similar a similar kind of application uh, of policy helps where you give loans to uh, countries that are unable to pay back and thereafter you can dictate terms and then you can you can play that on you, you look at doklam doklam happened in bhutan which is a, an indian ally 2017 the idea was also to test how much or how far india can go to protect its local ally so so it's a combination of several things and i see this conflict expanding into other geographies in terms of it being uh, becoming a surrogate conflict with other nations and uh, china using other geographical territories okay. to really put pressure and uh, so on and so forth so i think they, they, it's a combination of several reasons but certainly not an unplanned one thank you uh so i'm going to just take you back 53 years uh very quickly uh because you've actually set the context very well uh you've talked about uh you know 1965 and the chinese component there there's one name that uh, constantly props up which is general sagat singh and uh, i was just wondering if you could tell us very quickly about what happened in 1967 uh, from general sagat singh's perspective yeah so um general sagat singh i mean, let me take a step back that you know general sagat singh is arguably the greatest battlefield general that uh, history is is seen one of the greatest battlefield generals and arguably the perhaps the greatest that india has seen uh, along with general harbaksh <clears throat> so when you look at general sagat singh uh, his uh, his is 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 his sort of you know his journey starts in 1961 he of course he was there before um he fought in iraq you know second world war that was that was another history but as a leader as a military leader his journey started in 1961 when uh, you know again a history that's not been written about much is the integration of goa the annexation of goa in, into india general sagat played a part he was the one who actually took the call to you know go straight to panaji and this is this is something that has been a feature of general sagat's uh, leadership which was again uh, spoken about later on as as uh, somebody who believed in that uh, you know going for the heart of the enemy's uh, locations and and panaji in 1961 was the start of that thinking uh, as i say that you know the 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 way the the goa uh, move was planned uh, the plan was to surround panaji's plan was to surround goa but general sagat actually uh, you know went through with his uh, forces and and captured panaji and after that the battle was over the portuguese forces couldn't uh, really put up much of a fight so so that was the start and that kind of gives us a, a a little bit of an insight into how he 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 would think one of the things that he did during the goa operation was that you know there was there were a lot of people who were not there were some people some of his seniors who were not very happy with the way he moved and that was something that i would say you know general sagat did understand the did read the uh, the 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 tea leaves pretty well in 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 a battle or in a combat scenario and he took his decisions which sometimes did not sit well with the seniors uh so when uh, 1962 happened general sagat was not a part of the uh, china uh, india china war the, the debacle of 1962 general sagat was not a part of uh, this thing general harbaksh was not a part of it uh, general sam maniksha was not a part of it these were all heroes that kind of you know would be the flag bearers of india's victories that followed in the decade so general sagat again you know 65 uh, he was posted on the western front he was posted there in 54 and he was moved on the eve of the battle on eve of the eve of the war to sikkim which he was not very happy about because he was a he was a general who wanted to be in the thick of the battle thick of the war and he was pushed out to sikkim 
uh, but you know jal sagat uh, sometimes you know the 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 wars the battles follow uh, the military leaders and not the other way and in this case uh, general sagat moved to sikkim sikkim was a relatively quiet place so he spent a lot of time uh, traversing through the terrain you know understanding the lay of the land what what would happen there if uh, the enemy were to move in what would happen there if you were to do something else and and that's what helped him un- you know get a get a sense of the kind of decisions that he would take in the years to follow in sikkim as a division commander so when the chinese came knocking in on the doors in 1965 during the war which was happening with pakistan and tried to push him back he understood that you know this is something that he and there, there was there were two posts was one was nathula where which was under general sagar's jurisdiction there was jelapla and at jelapla the indian troops withdrew and the chinese troops came and sat there on the watershed till today the chinese troops are sitting there so we haven't we haven't gone back we have occupied the heights around jelapla but the chinese troops have come and sat there so that was a psychological domination which the chinese had imposed general sagat sat at nathula and that was a start of also uh, you know a, a kind of uh, a pushback that general sagat led in terms of uh, you know and a pushback and a change in the narrative wherein india had wrested the psychological uh, advantage from china which which again you know it, he he kind of displayed in 1967 1967 again uh, there was a and this is a, this is an important thing you know because he when the battle started and i wouldn't go into the specifics of it but the battle started and initially the chinese uh, troops had fired and uh, 30 or 40 indian uh, soldiers had died it was a it was a worsening situation uh, it was another it was going to be a repeat of uh, you know the the battles some of the battles that we lost in 1962 uh and it was going that way general sagat took a call had to take a call about using the artillery uh in 1962 india did not use the indian air force when we had a superior uh, air, air capability vis-a-vis the chinese 1967 general sagat was faced with a dilemma that he could only use the artillery Uh, against the chinese with the permission of the uh, pmo in delhi so he sent a message but he realized that he needed to take a call either he would follow the protocol of waiting for the decision to come and then he would take a call otherwise he'd be violating the protocol the second was the calling of protecting his country as a leader when you face with a dilemma you have the dilemma is about choices making the right choices on the spur of the moment and and that was a decision that he took uh which uh, turned the tide in india's favor he used the artillery by the time the 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 approval had come from delhi general sagat had already pulverized the chinese i think that that changed the the course of the battle and uh, so so that again typifies the way he thought he thought and he did what he felt was right at that point of time 61 he did that 67 he did that. 1971 so he went to the uh, mizoram in 1969 uh after after uh, after natul and chola he went he was posted to mizoram and he uh, in mizoram es- established the counter insurgency jungle warfare school which is the only uh, school of that nature in the world now that's something that is uh, you know that was thought through by general sagat in 1960s so the kind of far sightedness that he had looking at the insurgency that was developing in mizoram <coughs> and in the northeast at that point of time that this was something that was in that india needed in future uh, a training school that helped uh, the army uh, understand the insurgency better so he established that school in varangte which which uh, which is which one of the finest schools perhaps the finest schools of its kind in the world till today uh, and then uh, when 1971 arrived and in, interestingly in 1971 there was there was general sam maniksha uh there was uh, general jaggi arora and then there was general sagar these three generals were uh, in 1967 in uh, uh during the natula chola uh clashes the the battles uh general sagar was a div commander division commander uh general arora was his boss as a core commander and his boss was uh, general san manish all these three generals were a part of the campaign in bangladesh in bangladesh uh we all know general sam manik manik shah's 
Victoria's campaign. We know General Jacob. We, we've known the other uh, leaders who've, who've done so well. But it was General Sagat, who's, uh, who's, you know, one of the one of the uh, operations that he did, where he heli lifted troops across the river Meghna. And the Pakistanis were looking the other side. Let me put it this way, you know, you know, so that it's understood by everybody. Pakistanis were not expecting the Indians to come over the come over the river Meghna. But he uh, went over to the Air Force and he convinced them that he needed to get his troops across uh, the, the river. And in, a, in an operation, which was the first of its kind, he uh, got his entire uh, troops uh, moved to the other side and the Pakistanis were caught by surprise. In, in Bangladesh, India's plan initially was to surround, surround Dhaka, surround the towns, here again, and I, and I go back to Panaji, go back to Goa. General Sagat went for the heart. He went for Dhaka. So once he captured Dhaka, the, the war was over. It said that, uh, you know, uh, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, she told uh, General Sagat, and this is something that I heard from his aide, <clears throat> that um, she said, um, Sam got me Bangladesh, you got me Dhaka. So uh, this is something that, uh, you know, again, when you speak with people, the anecdotes kind of um, help you understand the, the nature of the relationship that uh, well thank you uh, thank you thank you for uh, a very fascinating input on general sagat i think uh, we haven't given him his due in our military history and i'm sure you're very proud as a fellow gurkha officer to be recounting his contributions uh, at, at various stages i believe there are questions for you from the audience so i'm going to quickly shoot a couple of questions uh, for your consideration and then we'll open it up for the Q&A. You mentioned the Nepal, which was something I was going to come to. It's really no coincidence that all of this is bubbling up at the same time. So my, my question to you have we, is, have we remained fixated with Pakistan for too long? I mean, there is a context to what I'm asking you. If you look at the whole sort of Krishna Menon episode leading to General Timaya's repeated caution that China was the elephant in the room. And we were kind of numbed into complacency with the Hindi, Chini, Bhai Bhai sort of slogans and so on. And then we know that 62 followed and we were pushed back considerably, you know, militarily in terms of morale and so on. Um, and you built that interesting link that China is, is still part of the game, whether it's Pakistan, whether it's Article 370, whether it's Nepal and the general sort of geopolitics of our subcontinent. So do you think that somewhere there's been a, an overfixation with Pakistan? Our relationship with Nepal is interesting. I mean, not just the Gurkha Regiment, our chief is an honorary sort of general in the Nepalese army. There's been a very rich sort of uh, exchange we've had. So do you think that we've, we've not uh, paid enough heed to our issues and our relationship with uh, our other neighbors? And have we, again, lulled ourselves into focusing on Pakistan over and above uh, all others. That's one. And my other question also, I guess I can leave it with you now, is are we winning the media war? When it comes to what's happening uh, at the border today, our media, of course, is running amok with it and we're getting uh, very interesting perspectives on what's up. China, I believe, is maintaining a sort of a radio silence on what is going on, other than the odd feed here and there about this being a matter of fact skirmish, as you said, I believe there's very little propaganda or media attention around Galwan. So I want to ask you strategically, is this a, is this a, a media battle that we're winning? How important is that in contemporary times? Because I think the marked difference between 67 and today is the availability of the, the media that we have. And does that make a particular difference to the way this uh, episode will play out in the days to come? Right, right. So, uh, you know, uh, your first question on Nepal and other countries. I think um, we, we moved later. So China moved uh, quicker. China has invested a lot of money, time and space in propaganda. They've done that over the years. Uh, if you look at China, there's a long-term strategy which drives some of these actions that we see. So the, the function of, you know, them investing in Maldives, them investing in Nepal, 
they uh, or going to Hamban Dota is is a thought through uh, set of decisions that are under an overarching umbrella of a hundred years war or some a of a longer strategy that China has, which is and I which is more of a civilizational uh, you know ambition where China after nineties after the Soviet Union went away and I'm just going to China and then I'll come to us. You know after the Soviet Union went away, China found itself as as a possible contender to be the the other uh, sort of uh, superpower in the world. And, and that ambition has grown. If you look at how uh, the SARS spread in 2003 and how the WHO reacted vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, January 2020 when uh, Corona came about and how the WHO reacted, you'll see the difference between Hu Jintao and, uh, and, uh, and that Le Peng and you know, that time and how um, uh, you know, Xi Jinping has has kind of manipulated the institution. So these are these are part of the larger plan that China has, and in that plan is is Nepal and you know Maldives and and Humble Tota. I think India and coming to India, I think India started late in terms of responding to it, and I I would use the word responding because uh, when Ch China uh, you know changed the government in Maldives, so to say, I would use the word change. Uh, India responded later and, and was mounting a campaign, etc. Humble Dota port happened because again China made sure that it was friends with Raj, uh, Rajapaksa and the loans were given, etc. So these were again the the encirclement strategy of China started much earlier. India woke up to this quite late. Uh, at certain places, India has has moved quick and moved thereafter. You know, uh, in the second second term of Rajapaksa, India's you know, Jay Shankar was the first foreign dignitary to fly down to Colombo and, you know, uh, speak with him and, and establish ties. Uh, with Maldives, India has again regained a degree of uh, control and influence. I know it's a small island. Uh, it's important where it is strategically. Um, Nepal is a very strategic uh, location. Bangladesh is one. But if you look at these countries, and I go back to that earlier point that, you know, it's easier to uh, for China and China has done that with a, with a lot of countries that you know come forward with loans um, and uh, and then regain control over over assets as in Humble Tota or with the political dispensation as in Nepal. Uh, now that is what China would do and will always do. If I were China, I would do that. Uh, I think, as far as India is concerned, there has been as far as Nepal is concerned, India Nepal ties. India should have done better over the years. Uh, given the organic ties that India has, given the people-to-people -people ties, I think uh, it's not always so that, you know, you need to have diplomatic uh, interventions or uh, the details or, or a plan there. You can, with Nepal, the ties are such that you can actually, you sh one should have had a track to diplomacy where one establishes ties alongside the government because we are all aware you know, Nepal went through a, a, a period of uh, uncertain, you know, democracy changes in power, frequent changes in power, uh, and, and administration in Kathmandu. So all of that happened. Their constitution was rewritten, etc. And I think we should have had that kind of a uh, track to diplomacy in place much earlier. Uh, we also have, uh, when I say long-term organic relations, I mean an Indian going to Kathmandu still does not need a visa. To so that is the kind of that is the kind of relationship we have had with Nepal, and I think uh, that's something that we need to cultivate in in times to come. And I think track to diplomacy is one of the ways that I see going forward with Nepal. With Bangladesh, again, we've had a, a relationship, an up and down relationship after seventy one, but we have gotten our uh, you know bearings and have gotten our relationship in place. But yes, uh, I think uh, that needs to happen better than what it has happened in the past. Um, Adit, I'm sorry. Uh, can you just repeat the second question a bit? I just so kind of it's the it's the media the media war that I asked you about. Yeah, so uh, I think that is something in today, given where we are, uh, battle of perceptions I would call it. And in the battle of perceptions, uh, again, we we move very slowly, and we move very slowly because we are bound by the thing. We we don't move as nimbly as we should, and this has happened earlier as well. This is uh, you know how we control the. Uh, or how the how we manage the information that moves out, how we how we uh, use technology, how we use the global media, how we use the perception that develops around us. I mean, 
for instance, the Galwan Valley that we talk about, how, you know, that that valley is used as a as an area of dispute in the international media, which is a wrong term, which is a wrong uh, sort of a phrase, is, is something that we need to look at as to why this is still used as a, as, a, as a disputed place, because it was not a part of the 23 disputes that India has with China. So it's as simple as that. However, uh, you know, the perception is that, oh, it's about a disputed territory. Uh, so this is one example. I think we need to, uh, you know, it happened uh, in 67, you mentioned 67. Uh, in, we didn't have the reach. We didn't have the kind of technology in the media reach. Today we do. And uh, we need to have a better uh, information uh, or uh, capability or, uh, you know, the ability to win that battle of perception, because that's something that is important, whether you are uh, having allies around you, whether it, it's in Quad or whether it's in the South China Sea, people are going to look at what your narrative is. And the narrative is generated by the perception that you put, you put out in the media. Sure. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm just going to move on to some audience questions. Uh, Gaurav Jabuli asks, uh, it, so one is he's asking uh, uh, how much, to what extent was the cultural revolution a factor in the 1967 exchanges, at least in terms of it not being accorded political priority in Beijing. Uh, the other is, is he's asking, uh, was the lack of, you know, the loss of, there was not much loss of territory in 67. So was that one reason why there wasn't political involvement? And uh, finally, he's asking uh, something that you've actually addressed very well in your book, uh, which is what were, what were the broad strategic outcomes of 1967? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think they're all uh, linked to each other. Yeah. So, I'll, uh, so, so cultural revolution, that's a great question. In fact, uh, you know, if you look at uh, what happened before 67, there were a lot of purges that were happening around that time. And... Uh, and, and again, uh, as I said, in the more, more you look at the present, the more you're reminded of what happened in the past. The more China has moved from a communist authoritarian, uh, you know, authoritarian uh, led leadership to an authoritarian communist leadership, I think the more they, they've remained the same. In 1962, Mao was again uh, facing a lot of internal problems. The, the internal issues force an external power projection. That has been the, uh, the that, that's been the continuing uh, you know, way of looking at, you know, that, that's, that's been the name of the game in China. That's, what, that's what's happened with governments in the past. You have internal issues, you have external power projections. It happened in 1962. It happened in uh, 1967. It may not have a direct sort of a link, but this was going on. There were lots of uh, rivals that were being purged, military generals, uh, people who were not agreeing to Mao. That had happened in 67, 66. Uh, also, so, so when when uh, the Natula and Chola battles happened, it was also preceded by something that had happened earlier in the year, wherein Indian diplomats were put under house arrest, and a similar thing had happened in Delhi. So the relations were going down. In 1966, Doklam happened. That was the first time Chinese soldiers moved into Doklam. So all this was building up. It was building up. China didn't expect India to hit back as it did in Natula and Chola. And that's what changed the, uh, the thinking there. And, you know, because there was so much, uh, it, was, it was thought of that, you know, oh, we have an internal problem, we'll just go and, uh, you know, hit the Indians out there. That was, that was the thought that was there. Uh, however, it changed that uh, narrative at that time. In, if you look at the impact of cultural revolution, in, and this is something that figures in the book, two years after 67, China and Russia, or the, then the Soviet Union, went to battle along the Usuri River. And again, it was a, it was a function of uh, the things that were happening around the Cultural Revolution because uh, they were, you know, foreign dignitaries were, were made to walk through the roads wearing dunce caps, where, you know, various, uh, some of these things which I have mentioned in book as well. So these were happening at that point of time and China kept finding it itself isolated. There are reverberations to, to the current scenario. Uh, kept finding itself isolated because of some of these actions that it took at that point of time. So, so that was uh, then the the impact. Your question about the impact of sixty seven on on uh, on the history to follow is that is that what it is? I think? Yes, yes. What is the impact of sixty seven? Yeah. So, so the impact of sixty seven. Uh, there were two two. I would put it at two levels. One was the immediate impact of sixty seven on the nineteen seventy one war. 
uh, and I said that earlier that you know uh, China couldn't really uh, you know come down, sick him, and cut India off at uh, uh, you know the chicken's neck that runs along Siliguri. They would have linked up to these Pakistan uh, forces. Uh, that was one. And the other, the, the again, the impact in 1971 was that you know, though the the uh, the Pakistanis, though the Americans, then by then the uh, by then Kissinger and uh, Nixon had become great friends with China. Kissinger and Nixon wanted to have the Chinese troops move close to the borders, uh, threaten India. We can always say that, you know, Soviet troops were on the other side and China was committed in two fronts and therefore couldn't move. But that was one of the reasons. Uh, the other reason, which is not, uh, you know, which is kind of underrated, but which is equally important, was that the fact that the Chinese had lost the confidence to really push India down from Sikkim. And that's captured in, uh, you know, this is something that I, that I picked up from books written in 1968. Uh, Roderick MacFarquhar had uh, mentioned earlier that you know in, by 1968 China realized that it could uh, it still had an advantage but it could not push India back the way it could in 1962 and the result if you go back was 1967 so that was the immediate impact the long term impact we know that you know over a period of time uh, and, and the second impact was that you know uh, in 1975 Sikkim became a part of India. That was also because uh, by that time, the, the prime minister was given inputs by the uh, raw research and analysis wing that, you know, Sikkim was going to be the next post of China, uh, staging post because Tibet was already in their hands. And if Sikkim would, uh, was, to be, was to go away to China, then um, they would be sitting close to Bihar or Bengal. So that was, that was a, it led to the integration of Sikkim in 1975. Um, it also enabled uh, India, I mean, there was a long pause as far as India-China hostilities were concerned, we all know that. And 1986, Sondarung Chu happened, which I spoke about a little earlier, how Indian troops moved ahead and again pushed the Chinese. It also meant that uh, the last Chinese victory goes back to 1962. And that's where 1967 is, is important because it started a trail of defeats for China, 1967. 1969 into Suri against the Soviet Union, and they suffered losses in uh, 1979 against Vietnam as well. Uh, so it, you have today a Chinese army which has not seen action since 1962. Um, in 1962, to be fair, there were soldiers who had seen action in Korea in 1953. They were hardened soldiers. Today you have an Indian army which has had uh, uh, many wars with Pakistan, 71, 99, and 84 in Siachen, which is a battle again. Um, and, and various counterinsurgencies, counterterrorism campaigns, uh, UN campaigns, etc., overseas, uh, versus a Chinese army which is uh, which has not seen uh, battles or wars. And a battle-hardened army is is definitely an army that you would uh, you know, say has a great advantage. So that's that's what it did. 1967 laid and it changed the narrative, changed the India-China narrative. Uh, completely on its head. And it was the inflection point, the, the changing point, uh, the watershed in history. It was also a geographical watershed, a political watershed, and a historical one. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to go back to a couple of more uh, uh, audience questions. Uh, they're a little forward looking, so, but I, I, I want to just squeeze in something very quickly about 1967 itself. Could you tell us about uh, two other people, KB Joshi, who you mentioned, and uh, Devi Prasad? Uh, because, I mean, these are really extraordinary stories and, you know, they're not very well known in India. Yeah, yeah, yes. So Colonel uh, K.B. Joshi uh, belongs, he, he served in my regiment, he comes from my regiment, 11 Kasudas, uh, Devi Prasad. And it, it, I'll, I'll narrate an interesting anecdote. You know, I was trying to get through to Colonel K.B. Joshi on the phone and you asked me earlier how I researched the book and I spoke with people, but it was sometimes, you know, um, reaching out to people, uh, was was would take time. So with Colonel KB Joshi, when I when I spoke with him, uh, he said I have already you know narrated already told people what I had to, and I don't think uh, you know there's anything more to say. Uh, he was not very convinced that I was actually researching for a book or doing something that would make sense. Uh, so I was quoted a few times, but I persisted uh, doggedly, and you know finally managed to land up in Dehradun one day. 
um, and uh, so you know at his house. So he said, you know, you come all the way from Dehradun, uh, from Mumbai to Dehradun, and we should chat. Is there any other thing that you have uh, in Dehradun? Any other work? from meeting me. I said, you know, look, uh, I've come all the way just to meet you. And so he gave me uh, five hours, continuous five hours of his entire journey of his life and uh, the battle of Chola, what happened, what happened thereafter. So um, interestingly, uh, how the journey started was in Burma. Uh, you know, he grew up at that time, which is briefly mentioned in the book uh, that, you know, he was... Um, and that's where he started his, you know, he was, he was, he had gone grocery shopping for his mother as a 12 year old boy. And, uh, and the Japanese planes uh, came overhead and started bombing the bazaar. And he, uh, you know, he was carrying a packet of sugar. Uh, that's all he managed at that time. And he was running home. His father was a, uh, was a mathematics teacher in a local school. And uh, by the time he reached his mother, his mother asked him why he's breathing him. He says, uh, you know, I'm fine. I'm I'm good because something is falling around me. So as you know, he, he, he kind of, uh, as, a, as, as a 12 year old boy, this was something that he had experienced in Burma, which is, which is kind of as a 95 year old um, uh, you know, ex uh, army officer, he still remembers that. Uh, that started and then of course he, he joined, he said, you know, my, uh, again, he joined in 1948, if I remember correctly, um, on the day of Mahatma Gandhi's assassination, he was, he was on his way to the Indian military academy and everything was closed. And then he, he joined the Gurkhas he, and it was 11 Gurkhas. And I must, I must say that, you know, this is a regiment that was um, uh, raised after independence and was raised from, uh, you know, from amongst the, the Gurkha soldiers who had opted not to go and join the, uh, the British Gurkhas. So, so this was 11 Gurkha rifles formed from seven and 10 Gurkha rifles who chose, from the soldiers of seven and 10 Gurkha rifles who chose to stay with India and, and be part of the Indian Army. So it was, it was raised as um, you know, a regiment in independent India, one of the first regiments to be raised in independent India at that point in time, 1948. Um, so uh, Colonel, Colonel Joshi, when he took command in Chola, and he'd gone there earlier in 1963-64, and he never knew, and at that point of time, that you know he would come back a few years later to, to command Delhi. Uh, so when he, when, when he, at Chola, uh, most of the officers of the battalion were were youngsters. But when I say youngsters, you know they were lieutenants. There were six, seventeen lieutenants. It was called a subaltern battalion because you, you had lots of lieutenants and uh, and soldiers who were not. It was a newly raised uh, unit. hadn't seen action earlier. So he was given the command of, you know, it was, it was an onerous uh, task of leading men who had not seen uh, battle or action earlier and a newly raised uh, battalion to put. Uh, but he did a, a fantastic uh, job there. And, you know, uh, after, you know, when, when this happened and I've narrated the entire Chola battle, he, he has such a robust memory. He could recount what had happened at each moment, at each point of time in my conversation with him. Then I spoke to the other people in terms of, what exactly transpired? Uh, so, so those things uh, helped, and I think uh, so. So his his leadership in his leadership, I think one of the things he had was he had a bulldog tenacity, a courage. And uh, when he went back, when he when he when he went up the Chola post along with uh, Captain uh, then uh, Captain Narayan Parulikar, who was uh, with him, they uh, they knew what. You know, he he had decided that this is what he's going to do. He's going to launch a counterattack on the Chinese, and he's uh, going to evict them. He was very uh, he had a single-minded uh, sort of pursuit, and is is even today the clarity in his thinking. Uh, you know, kind of tells me what kind of a leader he would have been uh, at Chola at that point of time. So that was him. Uh, Devi Prasad Limbu uh, was uh, someone you know who grew up in Nepal. Was a young boy. Uh, who had grown up uh, hearing the exploits of Gurkha soldiers in uh, Gajay Ghale and others in the Second World War. Uh, and uh, he had uh, had his training when he'd come here and you know, he'd done his cutter. He knew how to handle the, uh, the weapon that was issued to him. He was a simple soul. He'd grown up in Nepal who, who, had, uh, who wanted to roam the mountains, be a part of uh, soldiering. 
We heard stories about how Gurkha soldiers have quartered the Japanese forces in the Second World War. And these are stories that they grew upon when they, you know, the, these Gurkha soldiers would go back to the villages in Nepal and talk about what they had done in the Second World War. So he's one of those who had grown up hearing and, um, you know, getting all his tales from the from first hand from, from those who had gone to war in Second World War. So he, his action, my book starts with his action because I thought that was one of the most defining um, acts <clears throat> of the two battles where he uh, waded into the Chinese, broke through the front line and uh, with just his cookery. And he, uh, by the time uh, the Chinese had realized what had hit them, he had actually locked off five Chinese heads before he was shot dead. Um, the book starts with Devi Prasad's action because that is something that would go on to define uh, those two battles uh, and how it happened, what happened. And that also rested in a moment, rested the psych psychological advantage from the Chinese and set the tone of the, the battle of Chula that followed. Yeah, I mean, it's, battles are very contingent and it's uh, it's amazing how the actions of one person can actually have such a big influence, cascading influence. Uh, I just want to step back, go back to the uh, audience questions and... Uh, these are more high level questions, uh, more forward looking. Uh, Prasad Rani is asking, uh, can we neutralize China in their information propaganda by becoming more transparent on facts? You know, obviously we have different political systems. Uh, so, you know, does it make sense for India to be more transparent in a situation like the one we have right now? I think uh, we, we, well, I think, we we have um, I, I would put it this way I think we need to be quicker and uh, with uh, with facts we need to be quicker in terms of putting out our narrative putting out what we think is right and and, and it starts from getting the right piece of information uh, processing it and articulating it I think it's it's a process that we need to make sure that we have it right in terms of the timing uh, today. And, and transparency is again something that is dictated by security interests, by national interests. That again is, is something that is paramount. What I would think is the is a stronger dominant narrative that needs to be put out there, uh, which is which should be transparent, uh, of course. But uh, but it should also have uh, the uh, an element of of you know uh, putting out there our version, much more uh, uh, in a much more diff in a much more uh, convincing manner and much more defined manner before anybody you know has has, has their versions uh, it's also a function of how much reach you have in the international media what is the kind of battle what is the uh, you know the, the how do you see the battle of perceptions evolving it, it cannot be it cannot be episodic it cannot happen that you know this has happened now let's think of what we need to do i think it needs to have a grand media strategy how do we need to go about it what is the, how do we need to fight the battle of perceptions? And, uh, and that's how anticipating what is going to happen in the information warfare, uh, in information warfare elsewhere is, is what would enable us to be on top of our game. Uh, being transparent, yes. But I think uh, along with transparency, what we need to understand is how dominant is our narrative. And that's, that's what drives perceptions in the global forum today. All right. Uh, my boss, uh, Lieutenant General Prakash Menon, asks, uh, what lessons can be applied uh, to the salami slicing tactics that China continues to use today? What lessons from 67? Thank you, General Menon. Uh, sir, I think um, as far as uh, China's salami slicing tactics are concerned, I think uh, they've, uh, they've, they've learned how to slice in the sea as well, uh, in the waters, if I were to use it that way. So I think the South China model somewhere uh, is, is also interchangeably used in along the uh, LAC or in the South China Sea. So that's their strategy. Uh, as far as India is concerned, at the tactical level, I think um, if you look back, wherever we have surprised China, we have got the better of them. Uh, and I'll come to why I'm saying so. And I go back to 1986, or go back to 2017 in Brooklyn, where we didn't punch. Uh, go back to 1967, where there was a local leadership that really upstaged China. Didn't they didn't expect that? So when you when you and we have a three, uh, you know, we have a we have a long border with China, three and a half thousand kilometer long border, three four eight eight kilometers, uh, LAC with China. So I think given that 
in the past, if you look at China, they have uh, we have responded and reacted to uh, the Chinese moves, whether it is Dame Chok, whether it is uh, Dep Sang Chumar, Dolat Bey Goldi. I think time has come for us to uh, make sure that we make the proactive moves. It's a long border. I'm not saying that you know we should, one should wage a war. No, uh, there has been 53 years of uh, peace, and today if a skirmish has happened, it's a uh, it's a skirmish at that place. Uh, which China has initiated. They have broken the terms of engagement that has prevailed over the, nine, over the last 53 years, not us. So, so therefore, this opens up, opens up our options now. And we have a long uh, border where we could, uh, you know, if they've come from the West, we, should, we could go in from the East, occupy something, negotiate. We, uh, the, 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 the underpinning aspect remains that we need to operate from a position of strength. If we operate from a position of military strength, we'd be able to drive the political uh, bargains better. Uh, instead of responding to uh, Chinese moves, I think uh, this is something that we could look at and uh, options are there, whether it is at, at a tactical level or at a strategic level, as I said, you know, uh, we have been doing that in Sri Lanka or with our neighbors. We have been uh, you know, making sure, we've been trying to make sure that you know, China doesn't increase its influence there. And I think that needs to be ramped up as well. But at the tactical level, through salami tactics, I think India has uh, a lot of, uh, China has its Achilles heel, it's got a long border. It has got uh, disputes with many neighbors, whereas India has disputes with just, uh, with, with two. Uh, I wouldn't put uh, the Nepal issue as a dispute uh, at this point. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, India has its advantages, and uh, that is the advantage. And India, China can't commit troops from the other uh, sides uh, that it has. It has uh, troops. So, I think India does have an advantage of surprise, which India could deploy in times to come. All right. I'm going to try and squeeze in one last question from General Menon, but I'm going to have to ask you to answer in two minutes. Uh, it's basically, uh, does this victory tell us that military commanders must be given more latitude while taking military action against territorial violations? I absolutely agree. I think uh, history has given us these little stories for us to draw lessons from. Uh, conflicts do not need to, uh, you know, get into larger wars. They can be limited conflicts. They could be skirmishes, but they drive a larger point. And to that extent, wherever we have, and I said that earlier, you, you know, wherever you've had local commanders taking decisions, uh, the the impact of a sudden uh, or surprising or an element of surprise that you spring upon the enemy leaves the enemy uh, in a state of haze. And I think that is the uh, that is an immediate impact that you can have on the enemy. You can have that when you have local commander taking a decision. If it is if it is to go somewhere else and the decision were to come back, I think you've lost that moment. Uh, and to that extent, the skirmish remains local. The, the decision remains local. And, uh, you know, the advantage is of the initiator. And that's that's what happened in 67 and that's what happened in 86 as well. Uh, also, if I may put it this way, the local commander or the general in that place would, uh, would be aware of the terrain, would be aware of the circumstances and the underlying conditions. He's the best man to uh, take a call. If he's a general, then you have to give him that, uh, the, 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 that space to operate and take a decision. Absolutely. Wonderful. That's a great answer. Uh, thank you so much. We've run out of time. I'm sure we could discuss this for many hours more, but yeah, we'll have to wrap this up. Uh, thank you so much. It's been a free ranging and absolutely fascinating discussion. Uh, uh, thank you all for joining us uh, on the web. Uh, and yeah, uh, we'll see you in our next uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aditya. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Sondi. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.